five, four, three, two, one. Pop short. Hello, everybody, and welcome to a brand new episode of the One Puck Shot podcast. Uh, my guest this week is a, a long-term or maybe long-suffering scribe covering the New York Islanders, now with The Athletic. Please welcome to the show Arthur Staple. Hi, Arthur. How are you? I'm good, Rob. How are you? Thanks for having me on. Hey, it's great to have you. I'm very well, thank you. Thank you for taking the time to join me today. The Islanders are uh, one of the interesting or more interesting teams this season, certainly one of the big stories of the season. I'm going to start with quite an open question, so feel free to, to answer this as you wish, because I'm not sure there is a right or wrong answer to mm-hmm. it. Who exactly are the New York Islanders in 2018-19? Uh, I think they're um, they're a product of their new uh, their new coach and their new general manager. It's um, it, it feels very much like a Barry Trotz coach team, and uh, I didn't wasn't sure, and I don't even think Barry himself was sure that we'd see that just 49 games into the season, into his first year here, after the 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 whirlwind courtship between uh, the Islanders and him. You know, just a few days after winning the Stanley cup. He was on his way out of Washington and on his way to long Island and for a big contract. And it's, it's very different territory for the Islanders. Um, you know, over the last 30 years or so, um, you know, their lack of success has kind of been compounded by a, a lack of, of interest in, in opening the checkbook to, to bring in people like Barry Trotz who were at the, mm. at the top of their game. And, um, you know, I think the fact that that ownership, uh, you know, through Lou Lamarillo and, and he was someone who they they uh, paid a big price to to entice to come here. Um, I think the fact that they were aggressive really signaled to the guys that were on the team that have you know carried over from previous years that uh, that this team was maybe headed in a different direction and, and helped soften the blow uh, just a few days after Barry signed on of John Tavares leaving. So um yeah, I think they've they've really adopted that identity. It's it's been a very uh, underdog mentality uh, on the <laughs> island, unfortunately, in relation to the Rangers, the you know kind of the, the big brother little brother scenario they've had here <laughs> for a long time in New York. Yeah. But uh, but I think this year, uh, taking that underdog mentality and really running with it because of a Tavares uh, decision and because of the way they were perceived around the league going into this year has uh, has really unified them and put them at the top of the division right now. As you say, top of the division, 62 points there, uh, eight points ahead of Buffalo in ninth. So you, you'd like to think the Islanders have probably done enough to, to hang around and claim a playoff spot, which I think before the season would have been a, the real best case scenario. I think a lot of them bubble at best. But, uh, you know, the, the things that, that jump out are goals against. Obviously, last season they were one of the worst teams in the NHL. This season, or well, right now, they've got the best goals against per game. In the entire NHL, obviously we mentioned Barry Trotz coming in. I mean, you see these guys on a nightly basis, shall we call it? I mean, just how much of an impact has Trotz had in the defensive zone? It's uh, it's amazing, and, and you know, and I think uh, for fans and even for for writers and observe other professional observers of the of the teams in the league, um, you know, you you can fall into a narrative trap a bit of of you know when the team is as as, mm. as much in disarray defensively as they were last year that these guys can't do it. You know, this group couldn't possibly turn it around. And I think, um, you know, I think with Lamarillo and Trotz coming in, uh, you know, the, the way that they've talked about it, uh, the way Lou said to me in an article that just posted on the athletic today is it was, uh, no preconceived notions about anybody, regardless of what had happened before. Um, what they, maybe they, they saw as an opposing coach and opposing GM before. And, um, I think that really benefited a, a lot of guys who, uh, maybe people thought, weren't capable of of playing this way playing in such a cohesive style because of what went on last year and even in the couple of years before that so um it's uh it's really fascinating and even in talking to people i know on other teams and other coaches i think uh you know the the thing that they say is it's impossible to get to the front front of the net on this team and i think anybody who watched last season unfold would be <laughs> that would be the most surprising thing to hear because the front of the net was was home to opposing players you know it was they were giving up 50 plus shots a night uh, for a long stretch in the middle of the year and and not just the shots but but incredibly good scoring chances from those prime scoring areas and and Yara Halak and Thomas Grice uh, would certainly 
look as exasperated as anybody after a night of facing top quality shots and top quality chances and and trying having to be at their absolute best to to just eke out a point or two so it's um it's obviously you know the the goaltending has been outstanding uh with grace still here and with robin leonard coming in um but even just with that the overall team defense and i think you can see the their past three games uh, given up fewer than 20 shots a game in all three of those and, and you know washington was one of them a, a team that they're competing with at the top of the the division and um you know so it's it's uh, it's a pretty you know it it's hard to really put it into words to to say what kind of turnaround that's been like i'm sure it's completely unprecedented in league history to see such a such a complete uh difference uh, in a team that's essentially the same 15 or 16 players and and at least one of the same goalies from from a year before you mentioned the goal is there, Thomas Grice, under contract for uh, one more year. Robin Leonard brought in on a one-year deal, which I think it's fair to say has worked out quite well so far. <laughs> you wrote an article for The Athletic on Friday. You mentioned the uh, the goaltending situation. Ilya Sorokin, of course, in the KHL still, he's got one more year uh, of contract with CSKA, but he can buy that out himself. The Islanders can't get involved, but he can buy it out if he wants to come to North America. I mean, what's your take on, on the goaltending both now and more importantly moving forward because it's such a key position and it's one that maybe has been shaky for the Islanders traditionally, shall we say? Yeah, that's uh, a quarter century of shakiness, I think we could probably <laughs> say. Um, yeah, it's you know it's the position that, that Lou Lamarello has historically valued the most and I think in, in hearing about uh, the, the inner workings of his conversations with John Tavares in the six weeks or so that Lamarello was on the job that he had to try to convince uh, Tavares to stay. I think that was a hot topic of conversation, not only from Lou's end of se- of needing to solidify that position, but I think even from John's end of, you know, he's played with a bunch of different goalies and a bunch of different mm-hmm. systems and it's never quite worked out. And I think uh, that had to play some, some percentage role in, uh, in John's ultimate decision. So it's, um, it's certainly a focus of, of Lamarillo's. And I think when you hear, uh, you know, leaving aside, Leonard's fantastic uh, kind of comeback season and, and the idea of enticing a, you know, a, a world-class goaltender like Sorokin, who's still a very young guy, too, with all the experience he's had in the KHL. Um, you throw Sergei Bobrovsky's name into the mix. Uh, he's had some, some struggles in Columbus. He's had some off-ice issues there in the last couple of weeks, and it seems quite certain he's destined to get to free agency in July. And, <laughs> yeah. and uh, you know, the Islanders have kind of been attached to to him for for weeks now even just in the promise of maybe he, he hits the open market so um it's obviously a priority and i think um Leonard's play has really maybe changed some minds in there you know like you said it's a one-year deal he was kind of a uh you know a, a court of last resort on the free agent market uh there was obviously with the article that he wrote for us uh in the athletic back at the start of the season the the incredible struggles he had uh, in his personal life with with drugs and alcohol that he needed to get get right uh, towards the end of his time in buffalo last year and all throughout the summer i think he was thinking that there were going to be no offers given what he'd been going through and the islanders brought him in uh to see what he could do and here he is you know he's certainly uh in the running for a Vezina trophy as the top goaltender if he plays a few more games he's been amazing the last six weeks so i think maybe that uh, changes the dynamic a bit going into the off season. Obviously, Sorokin is is their property, and they want him here in their in their North American pipeline. And uh, he seems eager to come here, according to the people that I've talked to. Uh, so I would imagine that if you saw Sorokin here uh, on a one year entry level deal for next year, uh, and perhaps Robin Leonard back on a three or four year deal for for a decent amount of money four million, four and a half, five million, something like that. That to me sounds more palatable than than going for broke uh, on July one with with a thirty one year old Sergei Bobrovsky at seven years and maybe eight or nine million per those, those long term deals with goalies always seem to look bad <laughs> by year four or so. Um, so yeah, I mean they, they have options now where maybe uh, t- you know they might have thought coming into the season that this was going to be a uh, uh, let's just get through this year and then figure it out afterwards. But now I think with the, with Leonard's play and Sorokin's interest in coming here, it's uh, it's opened up some some interesting possibilities for them going forward. Does it change how they approach people like Jordan Eberle as well? He's a, a UFA on July one. He currently earns six million dollars. A good player by all accounts, at, at least a top six NHL forward, if not top line. You know, he's, as I say, UFA, Anders Lee, the captain, of course, needs re-upping as well. Adders, does Brock Nelson. 
does having that flexibility in net all of a sudden, does that change the way they approach these other free agents, do you feel? I think so. You know, I think when Lou talks about keeping an open mind coming into the season, you know, there haven't been there. There have certainly been conversations uh, with Anders Lee, Lee's representative. And I think that that was kind of obvious to everyone when they put the, the captain C on his on his sweater on opening night. Um, you don't really they're not <laughs> eager to do go through another captain leaving in free agency for nothing <laughs> on July 1. So I, I, I think it was clear that they had interest in keeping him long term and there have been conversations, but not really too much else with the other with the other two or even with Leonard. Um, you know, I think Lou is a, is a guy who operates uh, in his own time frame and um, he still wants to see. Obviously, they've had a very incredibly good first half of the year and then some, but he still wants to see what this team is going to be uh, when the game starts to get tighter uh, after the, the all star break and certainly into the playoffs. Uh, that will probably determine a lot about nelson and eberly and and maybe even leonard but i think with eberly uh, you know if you look at it right now he seems like the odd man out maybe that's a spot uh, that that top first or second line right wing where they can they feel like they can improve um he's had an okay year i think he's been better since he came back from from his minor injury that cost him a week or so um and really that's spot you, you know you, you start to dream big if the team is good and and they've got the resources which they certainly will have a ton of cap space come july one you think about a guy like Artemi Panarin filling that top line right wing spot uh, instead of a Jordan Eberle or instead of a Josh Hosang, uh, and suddenly this team looks a lot different. So, um, you know, I think the patience is uh, is going to continue, and I don't imagine they're going to make any decisions. And really, as we head towards the trade deadline, with so many teams in sell mode, there's a lot of teams that probably feel like they're out of it and need to get something for their their expiring assets uh you know it would be hard to envision uh Lamarillo just dumping Everly off to get a third round pick or uh, a b or c level prospect because this is a guy who could help them you know get to the playoffs and, and maybe win a round or two there so um it, it'll be interesting to see how that goes but i think for now you think uh when you look at their free agents lee is certainly at the top of the list to be re-signed i think brock nelson has done enough to to stick around as the number two center he's been very effective this year and maybe eberly is uh is kind of the expendable asset right now but that could certainly change in the next few months you mentioned the trade ed- deadline there arthur i mean what what's the island's approach going to be heading towards there traditionally lula amarillo has been someone who, if he feels his teams can win, he will make moves to try and boost their chances. The Islanders have good young players in the pipeline, Bodhi Wild, Noah Dobson, Michael Del Cole, and Josh Hosang, we've mentioned as well. What approach does Lamarillo take uh, entering the trade deadline period? You know, I think he's like all GMs. He's he's going to listen, he's going to offer, he's going he's gonna to have his conversations. And I think, you know, I've covered this team long enough that when the Islanders were, were fairly inactive at a lot of trade deadlines, people assume that Garth Snow wasn't doing very much. And it's very, it's very much not the case. It's there always, there's always conversations. They're always trying to improve. It's got to make sense. Um, and I think when you, when you look at this team in a, in a logical unbiased way that, you know, the, they're not, they're certainly far ahead of where uh, their brain trust expected them to be. I think they all thought this was going to be an evaluation year for, for what's to come uh, down the pipeline in the next couple of years. And obviously, you know, the, the four high draft picks they had uh, last June, Noah Dobson, Oliver Wallstrom, Bodie Wild, and Ruslan Iskakov, uh, those are assets that they didn't really have a ton of. And I think that's ended up was the ultimate reason why they didn't make a lot of trades there at the, at the draft floor was that um, they don't have a lot of high end assets right now. A lot of, you know, if, uh, the few that they have, Matthew Barzal, Ryan Pollock, they're in the NHL. Josh Hosang and Michael Dalcall have, have kind of had brief breakthroughs, but have not quite broken through permanently. Um, and really beyond that, you see maybe Kiefer Bellows, uh, another previous first round pick who's in his first year pro and, and playing OK, but but is going to take some time. And then uh, kind of an unknown later round pick in Otto Koivula, who's really had a good first pro year in North America, but is, is a ways away. So you don't see a team that's loaded with with young talent i think they're maybe third or fourth oldest roster in the league it doesn't scream go for it right now at this trade (laughs) deadline um you know i think as we've talked about there's there's a lot of teams that are in sell mode so the the prices are low for sure but i i get the sense that uh you know maybe the third line where they've had valtteri filpola and leo komarov with some excellent chemistry but maybe not producing as much over the last 20 games as they did over the first 25 or so 
maybe that's an area where they can upgrade a bit. Their power play hasn't been very good all year long. They, they could use a, a guy to, to motivate and, and, you know, facilitate on that second power play unit. Um, so I've thrown out his name uh, in the athletic and in interviews, a guy like Brian Boyle, who's over at the Devils on, in the last year of his contract, who Lou traded for once before at the trade deadline when he was in Toronto, uh, got him from Tampa, and, and they almost pulled off an upset of the Capitals with Boyle in the lineup, ironically playing alongside Matt Martin on their fourth line back then two years ago. Um, but I could see guys like that third, fourth line, uh, guys who are you know veterans, who are the high character guys that Barry Trotz really likes to have, who can who can fit into a team that's really built on team unity and chemistry to this point. That's something that could be very fragile. And I think if you dropped a, a Matt Duchesne in there at the deadline, it might not go the way fans think it would go, and also would cost you an <laughs> awful lot. So um, you know, I could see them. Adding a depth forward or two, maybe adding a, a right-handed defenseman to, to kind of supplement just in case as a number eight guy, uh, seven or eight type of player. But uh, but I think the big names are ones that they'll more look at on July 1. I could certainly be proven wrong. I think uh, anyone who tries to guess what Lou does uh, <laughs> is, is, a, is a bit of a fool's uh, errand. But, um, but yeah, my sense is this team... And the and the guys in charge understand that this is they're they're ahead of schedule right now, and it's not they're not doing it with with their young core. They have to try to preserve as much of that as they can going forward. There's a couple of individual players I'd like to ask you about, Arthur, at, at different points in their career, at different points in their contract situation. The first is Anthony Beauvillier, who's an RFA uh, in the summer. The second is Andrew Ladd, obviously a veteran. He's missed a lot of time through injury this year. Quite a big ticket deal still. A lot of people were, to be fair, uneasy with the deal when Garth Snow signed him to it. Obviously, the injuries and some production drop don't help in that regard. But Bavilia the same, struggling maybe with production a little bit this year. What do you see as the future for Bavilia and Lad with the uh, New York Islanders? I mean, Bovillier is still, still a very young guy, and he is on pace for another 20-goal season. He's playing with his good friend, Matthew Barzal, and, and I... I think those numbers uh, look, you know, he's got 12 goals right now. It doesn't seem like a lot, but this is a team with with eight guys with 10 or more goals. It's a very balanced scoring attack, uh, and it's not it's not last year where Matthew Barzell is, is producing two or three points a night, sometimes four or five points a night. This is a team that that uh, values its scoring chances, doesn't uh, doesn't play a lot of run and gun. Um, so I think. Sitting there at 12 goals, and if you see Bovilli at the end of the year with with 21 or 22, which is right around where he finished last year, that's probably a pretty good year for him um, in this system. And I think the the value for him is learning more, much like it is for Barzell, is learning more away from the puck, being being strong in your own end, the, the defensive structure and the forecheck structure that that really has led to the results that they've gotten. Um, so I could, you know, I think he's got a future here. He's he's a versatile guy. He can play a little bit of center. It's great to have guys who have played center before and can take face-offs, and he's got some skill to play on the power play. Um, so I, I can imagine a, the sort of deal that Ryan Pollock got, a two-year bridge deal um, after his uh, after his entry-level deal is done, some something like that, you know, in the two-and-a-half, three-million-dollar range. Um, you know, I think that buys you a little more time uh, going forward when you start to think about Barzal needing a new deal and, and uh and maybe bringing in some big name free agents and as far as lad goes uh yeah it's been a disaster you know i think <laughs> uh, i think that july 1st 2016 free agent crop i saw a list of them the other day uh it is an unimpressive bunch and that was really you think back in islanders history it was such a pivotal day because that was the day that franz nielsen left and kyle mm. pozo left and matt martin left three core guys from a team that had just finally won a playoff round for the first time in in 20 years uh, and the one guy they really bring in, they focused on bringing in, was Andrew Ladd for his leadership and and all those other things. And it just never worked. You know, he did have 23 goals his first year, but uh, they haven't made the playoffs with him. He's had some back injuries this year, a very kind of a fluky knee injury that's still got him out. I mean, I think he's going to be back at some point, and he will help them. I think that's the that's the part that you know when you see you look at the contract first, and then you look at the stats, you say goodness gracious this this guy's a <laughs> this is a huge mess but i but he's a he's a real pro and uh and i think if you leave out that part of it and see him as a as a guy who can play on the third line who has a little bit of skill has an edge to his game is a very you know even in the last two years playing for for jack capuano and then doug Waite, where defensive responsibility was was pretty scarce he was a, he's a very 
responsible player. He's, he's a lot like Josh Bailey, where you, you don't notice him a lot, but sometimes that's not so bad, especially on a team that struggles to play defense. On this team, I think he fits in with what Barry is trying to do. And, um, you know, the, the, the contract is always going to just hang out there like a sore thumb. So I think if, if people are able to look past it and accept that this is a guy who's going to be a, a 35, 40 point guy playing mostly third line, maybe killing a few penalties, maybe playing a little second power play unit, that, uh, that that's an okay thing, especially with the amount of cap space they still have. I'm sure they'd love to unload that contract with, uh, <laughs> with still four more years to go, but, um, but I think that ship has sailed and uh, they're stuck with him. So, you know, I think if, if he can get back to just basic health, I think uh, I think he can help. You know, you look at some of those, you know, when you get guys back right around the trade deadline, uh, you know, and Thomas Hickey may be back by then, too. Uh, you know, there's a lot of teams that throw the cliche out of, out of <laughs> this is this is a, this is akin to making a trade and we didn't have to give up any assets. Mm. Um, both those guys are are smart veteran players and, and maybe wouldn't end up being regulars every, every night. But, uh, but I think they can help what the Islanders want to do. We mentioned the third line. We've mentioned that production on the third line has, has tailed off. Uh, we've also mentioned defensive responsibility. So if I say to you the name Joshua Hosang, what does that <laughs> say in your mind? <laughs> uh, it's, there's a lot of thoughts I have when you say his name. <laughs> um, you know, I, I've, had a lot of conversations with Josh. Uh, you know, I think one of those conversations got him into uh, some hot water at the end of last season when he was uh, stuck in the minors while the team was uh, was sinking like a stone at the NHL level, and, and he felt singled out. Um, you know, and then this year uh, he needed a, a personal day on day two of training camp after he and I had talked again at length about uh, changing his attitude, understanding what, what Lou wanted from him, what Barry wanted from him. Uh, and really never, you know, he just never showed much in training camp and went straight down and did play well, got back here, uh, got sent out again for kind of tailing his game, tailing off a bit, um, you know, and I think he's struggling again down in Bridgeport. It's uh, he's a he's an immensely talented guy and uh, and sometimes a little a little too much in his own head and 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 just not not being able to go with the flow. And it's, it's not a great quality to have as a person, a young person in life, but it, it's kind of an essential one uh, as a professional mm-hmm. athlete, especially a hockey player where everything is very team oriented. And, um, you know, it's hurt him a lot over his, over his youth career too in Canada. And I think he, he was very unfairly labeled from a young age as someone who was a malcontent as opposed to someone who was uh, just a different personality. And, and, uh, and that label stuck with him all the way up through the, 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 the night the Islanders drafted him. Uh, back four years ago so I, i'm curious to see where it goes for him from here you know he's the was also taken in the first round as michael del call and michael del call was was barely even a prospect still going into this season with uh kind of the no-show two years he had and, and he's managed to turn his game up a lot so i think you also forget that these guys are still very young uh in their in their careers at 22 um so there's still hope for him you know i i think a lot of fans uh place a lot of importance on him certainly in the in the online world of islander fandom that uh he's a guy who can make or break this team and i think you've seen that that's not the case uh he certainly been a, was a good addition for his 10 games but this is not a situation where they desperately need him um but I, maybe that will change down the road you know his his entry level deal is up at the end of this year uh i can't i can't imagine they'd they'd get him anything for him on the trade market since they're still uh, you know, probably half the league that was going to pass on him in any round in the draft four years ago. That's probably has no interest in, in having him in their organization right now. So I think he's he's stuck with the Islanders and they're stuck with him. Um, so maybe there's a way to turn this in more into a positive. And if there's anybody that can do that, it's Barry Trotz is a guy who who doesn't dismiss or uh, or denigrate anyone that's uh, that's with him. He's he's a very positive guy. And I think he sees sees the benefit and the good in, in almost everybody uh, that he's got in his organization. So, uh, you know, I don't think he, he's dismissed Josh and, and talking to him a little bit about after Josh had been sent down that, you know, he, he mentioned to me a couple of other guys he'd had in the past in Nashville, uh, a guy named Andrew Burnett, who had a very long NHL career who, you know, he'd call him up for 10 games and he'd be good for seven and then not good for three, he'd get sent down, come back, he'd stay for 20 games the next time and he'd be good for 17 and not so good for three. And it's just... It's progression, and I think uh, you know. I think for Josh, he probably thought he was past that after the two tastes that he had the last couple of years. But 
But there's new sheriffs in town with this organization and things have changed drastically. So I think uh, he's got to be patient and I hope he can be because um, he's a great guy to have around, a, a, a person that uh, fills the room with, with a really unique personality and a smart young man. So uh, I hope he gets it. We talked about a lot of the prospects, some of the veterans. Obviously, July 1 may have a big bearing uh, on the Islanders' future, depending on where they go with the goaltending. With, you mentioned Artemi Panarin, who's been linked with New York, specifically the Rangers, but hey, the Islanders are in New York too. They've got a new arena coming. Lou Lamorello behind the wheel, Barry Trotz behind the bench. Uh, I mean, to play crystal ball for a second here, where do you think, see this team heading, and do you think there is a road map to where they want to get to to be a contender of some form again? You know, I think this year, um, you know, it, it could certainly go off the rails, but if, <laughs> if they stay where they are and, and, you know, finish first or second in the division, be able to, to be the, the top seed in a playoff series for the first time in 31 years, which is an, uh, always an astonishing wow. stat when I look at it, that yeah. they've, they've made the playoffs a few times since 1988, but never been the top seed. Um, just to be able to host that first playoff game, whether it's in Barclay Center or in Nassau Coliseum, <laughs> still has yet to be determined. Just to add the usual, the usual crazy wrinkle with the Islanders, but um, wherever it is, I think that would be uh, a real accomplishment uh, for this this new regime and uh, and for a lot of players who were written off after the last couple of years. Um, you know, I think the the confidence, like I said, they're an older team, but I think mm-hmm. there's still some guys who have really emerged this year, uh, guys like Scott Mayfield, who's kind of been bounced up and down between the minors and the, and the NHL the last few years, who's really established himself playing with Devon Taves, who's also been quite a find who just got called up and doesn't seem like he's going back down anytime soon. They've been a really good third pair on defense. Both guys that are under 25, 26, Adam Pellick has had his struggles, but he's been very good lately. You talked about Anthony Beauvillier, um, you know, the, the reunited Casey Zizekas, Cal Clutterbuck, Matt Martin line has had a huge impact. And those are all guys that are signed beyond this year. I think just laying that foundation with what they've been able to accomplish um, has erased a lot of bad memories for these guys um, and made them realize they're they're good players. And mm-hmm. when they play the way that they've played, they can be a very good team and, and a dangerous team. And, um, you know, Barry Trotz is here for a long time and Lou Lamarillo may not be the GM uh, every day of his Islander career, but he'll be here for a long time. So, you know, I think just laying that foundation down and, and showing the league what these guys can do. Um, all the conversations I used to have with Garth Snow uh, as we approached July 1 and he would try to temper the expectations and say, you know, we, we've got to be a winner to, to be able to recruit guys. You know, the, the island is, is a great place to live. They've got a great new practice facility. They've got a new arena coming. But if you don't win, guys won't want to come. And, um, you know, that's that maybe not the case for the Rangers or the Leafs or the big market to the Canadians. You know, they can recruit with other things and, and their history. But the Islanders, um, I think winning really puts them on the map. And to be able to do it in a season when no one thought they could do it, too, I think gets them a lot of attention from the Artemi Panarins of the world. And, uh, and that may change change how they're perceived and change, change uh, you know, the course of things going forward. They're, they're going to maybe end up with a draft pick uh, in the 20s in the first round. And maybe as we get closer to the draft, uh, Lou Lamarillo decides as the offseason unfolds that maybe that's a time to make a big trade and, and bring in a, a top two defenseman or a top line forward. I, I just think that finishing – uh, even close to where they are right now um, changes the course of this franchise pretty drastically over the next few years. You, you mentioned Garth Snow there a moment ago, but before I let you go, Arthur, I have to ask, how different is it for you professionally covering a team from Garth going from Garth Snow to Lou Lamorello? <laughs> well, <clears throat> it's funny that, that people make the assumption that it's very different. Um, <laughs> Garth, and, Garth and Lou were maybe closer than any two GMs in the league. They're both... New England guys, uh, you know, Lou probably scouted Garth uh, as a young player and a, a potential draft pick. Um, when Garth first got the job, the first person that called him was Lou Lamarillo and said, <laughs> anything you need, if I can help you. So I think they, you know, it was sort of like a mentor mentee relationship, even though they were competing general managers for, for Garth's dozen years as a GM. So uh, Garth really operated, tried to operate the same way that Lou did a lot of secrecy, a lot of, um, doing things behind the scenes and not very much out front, very few interviews, even though there were a lot of off the record conversations between the two of us over the years. Um, and, uh, and you know, the, the, the big difference obviously was not a lot of winning. 
So it's hard to <laughs> hard to establish that culture, I think, of, of secrecy and autonomy when uh, when you're not successful. So right. it, it definitely changed the perception of, of Garth Snow. But um, but I think you saw the, the, the relationship that those two had when Lou brought Garth to the draft in June. And, you know, I think it, that was a, an, a, an unspoken acknowledgement that this was the, the infrastructure that Garth had put in place as far as the scouting staff and all the work mm-hmm. that they'd put in. And Lou wasn't about to take credit for it. Um, so I think there's definitely a level of respect there. And, and it's really not that much different. They're both uh, pretty charming guys when they want to be. I think Lou definitely has a reputation of being a very tough uh, person to deal with. And, and even in my Q&A, you know, I had a, a 20 minutes with him in his office uh, yesterday. And, and I know how, how he operates. He doesn't talk <laughs> about contracts. He doesn't talk about trades. I asked a question about the trade deadline. He smiled broadly and said, next question. And we had a good laugh. And, um, you know, I think it's uh, he understands that I have a job to do just as as Garth understood. I had a job to do. It's not always going to be what he wants out there, but uh, but he's always willing to talk. And and that's really, from my perspective, all you can ask. And and secondarily, having a person like Barry Trotz behind the bench um, has been a big help, excuse me, to me. because he's very accessible. I think he's he's so comfortable in his own skin that he's not hiding a ton. I mean, coaches always obfuscate and sometimes outright lie, and you have to deal with it. <laughs> but um, but you can have a conversation where I, I'm noticing this. Uh, am I on the right track? And uh, and he'll say yes or he'll say no, and it can spark a really interesting conversation. And and it's uh, you know my perspective is always very different than the the people that I cover and the coaches and the GMs and certainly. When you talk to the players, their perspective is very different from the GM and the coach. So um, it's it's good to have these guys here to to uh, you know in a professional manner, and and uh, there really to me isn't a ton of difference. Garth wasn't the the most uh, you know loquacious guy out there, the the one who would talk to a lot of different media people off the record or made a lot of friends. Um, but uh, but it's not that uh, that different for me from from Garth to Lou. One last Lou question that popped into my head. I remember years ago, I think this is when he was with the, uh, the New Jersey Devils, there was a photo in, I, I want to say the hockey news, of a wall in his office, normally obscured by two like velvet curtains, but he left it open for this photo shoot. And on the wall was the depth chart of every other NHL team. I always remember looking through the Avs one, Milan Heydu, Sakic, Forsberg. <laughs> Does he still have that now he's with the Islanders? Uh, I think the curtains were up if if he does that, but uh, but that's you know that again that's another one. Uh, Garth had that in his office too, and you know you tend to think it's a digital age and and guys uh, don't really need these wall magnets and things you know scribbled with contract status <laughs> and things like that. But it's easy to it's easy reference. You don't have to go digging around your computer, and and that was Garth's explanation. And I imagine he got it from sitting in Lou's office once upon a time. Uh, you know, early in his uh, in his tenure. So, I'm guessing uh, I'm guessing that Lou still has it. He's a, he's definitely a creature of habit. He's he's designed his office uh, at the Anders practice facility almost exactly to the to the to the couch position that he had it in New Jersey. So, I'm I'm guessing it's somewhere, but I didn't get to see it. Uh, Arthur, it's been uh, fantastic to have you on. Is there anything you want to promote or uh, tease before we let you go? Uh, well, everyone can follow me at Stape Athletic on Twitter and uh, at theathletic.com or the Athletic NYC uh, on the internet. Our site has uh, has been growing, and we have fans from all over the world. Uh, it's always amazed me that uh, the Islander fan base has always seemed kind of small compared to some other ones, but uh, they're out there and they're they're everywhere, even in the UK and in Europe, and uh, and it's always great to hear from them. So. Uh, if people sign up for the athletic, uh, it, it's uh, it's been a fun ride and certainly a great season to follow along. Yeah, awesome. I know there's at least three of us here in the UK. One guy I used to play with and one guy up in Sheffield. So <laughs> <laughs> there's at least a couple of us over here. But Arthur, thank you again for joining me today. Uh, enjoy the rest of your evening and the uh, Islanders game against the Blackhawks tonight. Exactly. Thanks a lot, Robert. Really appreciate it.